Which is more your preference? The Ice Bucket Challenge or meth? I'll let you know my preference, along with a moment of Roger at the end of the video. Let's look at some data. I've built a lot of custom forced induction setups over the years. I've also tried various kinds of intercooling. Well, technically, they were pretty much all after cooling, but let's call them what everybody else calls them, intercooling. I just happen to have two sets of data from the same long block making the same power with two different forced induction solutions, one of which was running air to water and the other one currently runs meth. That would be the sledgehammer. If you're a regular on my channel, you've seen it. It's the electric supercharger that we built that pulls 33, 34,000 watts going down track and put a 12 second car into the nines. So let's start with the Whipple. The Whipple had a custom copper air to water intercooler core built by, well, yours truly. Because after all, you know, for a long time I was a single dad, raised my daughter by myself. And what do you do when your kid's too young to, for you to leave the house in the evenings? Well, you go and you make stuff in the garage, if you're me. Anyway, remember that because this comes into play a little bit later on. But I started out with 140 feet of quarter inch copper tube, straightened each piece individually, made some tube sheets, and fitted them in one at a time. And then I soldered those things on. This is just regular like plumbing or electrical solder. I don't remember if I used rosin core or not, or I, I don't know, I don't remember. This was a long time ago. I think this was in 2015 or 2016 that, that I did this. And here's the core in all its glory. Now, why did I build a custom core? Well, because of the design of the Whipple setup, I wanted it to fit under the stock hood. The air had to travel two directions through it. It had to go across it and lengthwise along it and then across it again. There were no such cores. And copper does a much better job at transferring heat than aluminum. This thing's a little heavy, but it worked really, really well. What you're looking at here is the rear mount of the supercharger, which is also the inner cooler core housing. The gasket right there actually bolts to the upper intake manifold to the throttle body mount. Here's another look at it. In fact, let me lose myself. Look at the size of that throttle body on this thing. That's another thing that's important and it's going to come into play a little later on. And those two hose clamps in between the intercooler housing slash mount and the blower itself, actually the throttle body spacer, that's actually a bypass valve or a blow off from a Mini Cooper. And as for the tank, it's a three gallon high density polyethylene unit with one of those boat screw on cap cover things and a 2000 gallon per hour bilge pump. It fit perfectly inside the box. But before we put it in the box, we did some flow testing. Remember what I said about my kid earlier? It's over a gallon, way over. With the help of my loving child, we found out that the pump can move a gallon in five seconds. That's about 12 gallons a minute or 720 gallons an hour. Dad, it's gonna overflow. It's gonna, oh, it's overflowing. I did say loving child. Dad, you idiot! I miss those days. Those were good times. We also tested the pump's flow through the intercooler core, and it moved a good amount of water. But the high-density polyethylene three-gallon tank actually became the console in the car, and here it is installed between the driver and passenger seats, obviously. And when the whole assembly was put together, you had to bolt the upper intake manifold, the intercooler housing, and the blower itself together and lower them into the car as one unit. Everything fit in just perfectly. It cleared the stock hood and it made a good amount of power. Oh, and it whined. Before we get any deeper, I need to share a video with you all. What it was like in the car with the Whipple, with the air to water intercooler going. Cause I know there's gonna be a bunch of people saying, well, your DIY intercooler course sucks. It, it, it has to, cause you didn't buy it, right? <laughs> well, that thing would melt 10 to 15 pounds of ice in a high nine, low 10 second pass every time. In fact, check out this in-car video. Now that you know that the, the air to water tank is actually my center console, it's literally right under the camera, you can hear the ice knocking around in the tank before the pass. And then obviously enjoy the velociraptor screaming as it goes down the track. And then listen to how much less knocking, there's almost none after the pass. 
Literally, it would melt 10 pounds of ice in a pass. The thing worked. Check it out. But now let's take a look at the sledgehammer. The sledgehammer is effectively an electrified Vortec and it looks like this. As you can see, there's a rather healthy RC motor. It's made by a German company called LMT. Believe it or not, that thing actually develops 53 horsepower. It draws 670 something amps at 50 something volts, depending on voltage sag on the pack. You can see the connectors, there's six of them. You'll see the cables in a second. Here's another look at the thing, looking down. Obviously, I removed the gear train. It's effectively direct drive. There's tons of videos on my channel about this if you're interested in the build. And installed, it looks like this. Now, this picture was taken before the methanol was installed. But if you look next to the throttle body intake elbow, you can see the heavy cables that go to power the motor. In fact, the cables weigh more than the actual unit itself does. And this is how I installed the nozzles. There's three methanol nozzles in there. There's a video on that as well. But they inject into the volute. It helps improve the efficiency of the compressor. We took it to the dyno and it made more power and the whole combination worked really well as well. So let's take a look at the Whipple time slip compared to the sledgehammer time slip. So the Whipple is on the left. The sledgehammer electric supercharger is on the right. The Whipple has an air to water intercooler running ice water. The electric supercharger has methanol injection running 100% methanol. It's about 30% of the engine's fueling. Look at the times. Look at how close they are. Then take a look at the boost pressure. The Whipple needed an average across the run of 14.3 PSI to match what the sledgehammer could do on just 6.3 on average. But again, look at the times. 60 foots within 13 thousandths of a second the 330, the electric supercharger is actually faster by about 15 thousandths of a second. The 660 time, again, the electric supercharger has it by about 11 thousandths mile an hour. This is where the Whipple starts to gain a little bit of an advantage. And, you know, what, two tenths of a mile an hour? Come on, it's nothing. And look at the quarter mile ET, 997 versus 998. Now, the mile an hour at the stripe does show a little bit of a difference. It's almost two miles an hour. But I want to make this point, and there have been a number of comments from people who didn't seem to understand what density altitude means. Density altitude is the equivalent altitude that does take into account not just your actual altitude, but things like temperature, humidity, barometric pressure. All that stuff helps calculate density altitude. So on the Whipple Pass here, this was a mine shaft air day. This was a negative DA. And with the electric supercharger, it was about average. It was in the 60s. It was, you know, it was a nice day. It wasn't particularly hot or anything, but it was not the Whipple. Plus, this was only the third pass with the electric supercharger plus methanol. At this point, the Whipple had been to the track numerous times. It's seen all kinds of development to get to this point. I'm confident in saying that ultimately, the electric supercharger at 6.3 PSI is going to blow the Whipple out of the water. But these are comparable time slips. This is where we are now, and this is the data we have. Incidentally, there's no difference in the engine. It's the same cylinder heads, the same camshaft, the same rocker arms, the same intake manifold, the same headers, even the same mufflers. Everything is the same. The only difference is the forced induction. So let's start by looking at the Whipple's data log. So the first log I want to show you is actually just a screenshot. This is an old log. It's got to be from 2015 at least. This is the Whipple without air to water intercooling. Now take a look at the green trace in the bottom graph. That's the manifold air temp. You can see if you look down at the average, it was 156.9 degrees and during the pass, it hit a peak of 176.1. Now this is a Fox body and Fox bodies do put the temperature sensor down in the lower intake manifold. They do have a tendency to read a little bit hotter down there than they would say if they were in the upper intake manifold or where most OEMs put these things now in the intake tube, but it's the relative temperatures that we're really interested in. So 
Oh, the other thing that's worth making a point about, check out the boost. This was an average of only 9.3 PSI on the Whipple. So I pulled the thing up another 5 PSI, and had I not run the air-to-water intercooler, I very likely would have melted down the motor, because this, this is 176.1 degrees, is starting to be on the borderline of unmanageable. But that's what it looked like without the air-to-water intercooler. So this is the Whipple with the air-to-water intercooler. And it's averaging 14.29 PSI. So it's making more boost. And it saw a peak mat during the pass of roughly, let's call it 134 degrees. So we're seeing, what, over a 40 degree drop? That's pretty impressive. Now, there's one thing I do want to point out to you all. Look at this green line right here. Check this out. This is actually throttle position. Now, if you've never had the joy of launching off a trans brake in a car that can pull the fronts, it's an experience. I think everybody should experience that at least once in their lives. It is the greatest thing ever. It is better than... I won't be specific, but it's better than anything else, right? The first time you do it, you swear that all of your drivetrain is on the track behind you, but it's not. It's violent. It's an experience like no other. I could go on and on about this, but the point is, it's hard to keep your foot to the freaking floor, and that's what happened here. My foot actually got pulled off by the violence of the launch down to about, I think, what is this, about 80, 82%. Now, remember the size of the throttle body on this thing. It's huge. So it didn't make a difference in terms of boost. This little dip here is a natural dip that occurs in pretty much every single data log with the Whipple. But, but there you go. We saw an honest drop of, what, about 40 degrees, right? So if we go back to this guy here. You know, 176 versus 135. I mean, yeah, it's it's 41 degrees. So the air-to-water intercooler works, and it works well. So to sum up the performance of the Whipple with the air-to-water intercooler, it dropped 40 degrees. It worked well. But how well did the methanol do with the sledgehammer? Let's take a look. So this is the sledgehammer with no methanol. You can see that the IATs did go up. And it peaked at, what, 145 degrees. Not terrible because it's lower boost. And that, by the way, is one of the advantages of an electric turbo. You don't have the parasitic loss. You have much higher efficiencies. So, therefore, you can run much less boost to make the same amount of power. And that, of course, means you can run more timing. Your tuning window is bigger. There's And there's less heat in the intake charge, as we can see here. There are so many winds to this thing. That it just, it, it's unbelievable. But because it is compressing the air, well, it's still gain some heat. So I wanted to try methanol and this is what happened. Look at that. Let me lose myself here so you guys get a better look at that graph. Again, take a look at the IATs, which is the red line on the bottom graph. It just dropped and dropped. I mean, there, there really is no contest at all between the two. There really just isn't. Again, I did this in the previous video. No meth, meth. But let's talk actual numbers here. So we hit a high of only 102 where the car really started to move, but we hit a low of 64.8 degrees. It's like 65 degrees. That's roughly what it was ambient temperature wise that day. That's pretty good. In fact, that's, that's better than pretty good. That, that's fantastic. Now I've already covered the concept of the methanol cooling the sensor directly itself. And I did address that in the previous video, but you know, it, it, you just have to think it through logically. Okay, if the methanol is cooling the sensor, then it's cooling everything else as well. That cooling function comes from a phase change. It converts from a liquid to a gas, and that takes energy. And that energy comes in the form of heat. It's really just that simple. So, I mean, you know, think this through, but if you've ever stuck your hand in front of, uh, you know, a compressor of some sort of supercharger or a turbocharger, when it's going full tilt, you'll know how kind of silly it is with the notion that, oh, it's pulling on the sensor. It ain't pulling on nothing, I can tell you that. But I would like to do that as a test just to prove the point. Again, there may be a little bit of that effect, but even if there is a little bit of that effect, just think it through logically. It doesn't matter because it's also cool. It's not like it's just aiming for the sensor. Oh, there's a sensor. Let's cool the sensor. No, no, that's not how it works. It, it's getting the, the walls of the intake manifold, the air charge, the valves, everything. So... You know, this is, I believe this to be a very legit cooling of the air charge. 
Now, methanol also brings a few other advantages to the party. Not only does it cool the charge, but it adds octane to your fuel so you don't have to worry about detonation. In my case, as I mentioned, I'm using 30% of my fueling coming from the methanol injection. However, because we're also injecting the methanol into the volute of the compressor, it effectively makes the compressor act bigger by moving the compressor map to the right. So that was something that we were running into. We were in the choke region. So that all conspires to add more power. And of course, when you have a cooler charge, you have more octane, and you have a more efficient compressor, all that conspires to make a lot more power. You can run more timing. Now, one of the things we can't do with the electric supercharger is we can't add more boost, but we can always add another electric supercharger. So does that mean methanol is better than air to water? Well, it depends. As with everything in life, of course, oh, it depends. You just scrolled through this all the way to the end to the conclusion. Like, which is it? Well, it depends. Damn it. It doesn't depend. Tell me. Uh, it, it really depends. Ultimately, I think air to water intercooling can take more heat out of the charge, especially as boost pressures start getting higher and higher and higher. However, air to water intercooling does cost you some boost because the intercooler itself is a restriction. It has to be in order to work. And it doesn't do things like add octane to the charge. It also can't make your compressor seem bigger than it is. But it does have its applications. There are some more downsides to it. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that the thing would melt 10 to 15 pounds of ice in a pass, which meant I would show up at the drag strip with 60 to 80 pounds of ice in, the, in a cooler in the trunk of the car because I would drive the car to the track. <laughs> and, and as I used it all up, it would get a little lighter and a little lighter and a little lighter. But, you know, those tiny changes in weight actually never really showed up in a time slip. The weather throughout the day would make a bigger difference. But then there was the methanol, and obviously the methanol made a whole lot of power. I think the methanol is better suited for lower boost situations. The methanol is a lot less work at the track. You just got to carry a little bit of methanol, and that's it. No ice. You don't have to stop on the way there. I mean, you, you, you know, the methanol I'm using has been in storage for like four years. So I think for lower boost levels, if you're running pump gas, if your car is a street car, I think methanol is the better choice, frankly, in most cases. Just be sure there's safety systems in place. For example, my car, if it detects an AFR of over 12.5 to 1 for more than half a second, it'll kill the ignition so it doesn't hurt the engine. There are pros and cons with both, but that also doesn't mean that your air-to-water intercooler can't fail either and end up with kind of the same problem, except it's a little bit more severe with methanol, especially since it's part of your fueling. So there are pros and cons to each one, but for a low boost street car like the LTD and the 800 horsepower range, here's a sentence I never thought I would say. I like meth. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and here's your moment of Roger. Good boy. Come on, buddy.